Traditionally, defensive architecture and monumental construction are considered to be signs of culturally complex, settled societies based around agriculture, and there is plenty of archaeological evidence to back up that viewpoint. However, that idea is being challenged with recent finds from Siberia, where the oldest fortified settlement in the world to date has been discovered, but without the corresponding evidence of agriculture that we see everywhere else. Instead, it looks like the region was still home to populations which engaged in hunting and gathering at the time of its construction. Located in the Kanti Mansi Autonomous District of Russia, approximately 4.5 kilometers from the nearby village of Kazim, is the site of Omnia 1, a settlement dating to about 6000 BC and constructed on a steep promontory from which it overlooks a series of peat bogs. It's situated near the Omnia River, a tributary of the Obe system hence the name of this prehistoric archaeological culture, the Omnia Complex. This is the oldest fortified settlement currently known, as well as being the northernmost fortified settlement dating to the Eurasian Stone Age, and it is just one of eight similar settlements in the surrounding region, the closest of which is Omnia II, located about 50 meters from Omnia I. The site was first discovered in 1987, and a series of excavations over the following 13 years revealed a series of ditches, which later turned out to be defensive in nature due to the discovery of a palisade, indicating that the site was indeed fortified. Western Siberia was abundant in natural resources around 6000 BC, the time of Omnia I's construction, and there is plenty of material evidence to demonstrate that people living there during and before that period were hunting, trapping, and fishing everything from elk to fowl to fish. The exploitation of those natural resources, however, appears to have increased substantially around 6500 BC. Prior to that date, the archaeology indicates that the bulk of the hunter-gatherer population was living around the Ural Mountains, with very little evidence to suggest human presence east of that mountain range in significant numbers. But, starting around 6500 BC, when the exploitation of natural resources began to increase, pottery begins to show up in larger and larger amounts in the archaeological record, and it gradually began to spread east. Going along with this spread in pottery is the appearance of cones, large mounds containing human remains, especially skulls, and figurines, with the largest combs measuring 50 meters in diameter and 6 meters in height. It's not entirely certain what the purpose of these mounds are, but given the contents it's thought that they are burial mounds or something closely related, dealing with ritual depositions. It's in this context that Omnia 1, and then the other sites in the Omnia complex, begin to show up. The site in question contains 10 pit houses, all being either rectangular or square in shape and ranging between 3.2 and 4 meters for the smallest, and 6.1 by 6.8 meters for the largest, with the depth of the pit houses varying between 0.6 and 1.8 meters. The major problem with interpreting these houses, however, is that very little in terms of organic material has survived. There isn't really evidence of any sort of stonework which suggests that the main building material was probably wood, and which has since rotted away. But, based on comparison to other sites dating to different periods in Siberian history, it's likely that the pit houses at Omnia 1 had floors and walls lined with wooden planks. What we do have evidence of, though, are post holes situated around the pit houses, which probably means that the roofs were made of logs, with the main posts being anchored in the post holes and joined together to form a pyramidal shape, supported by a post and lintel system. The roofs probably were not fully closed, however, as we have evidence of raised hearths in the middle of the houses, which means that the smoke from fires had to travel somewhere, so archaeologists currently think that there was an opening somewhere in the structure. There are two types of pottery found at this site. The first is incised, and the other is stamped with comb-like decorations, with the second form probably being younger in creation. Forty-five vessels of either make have been discovered at Omnia 1, along with stone blades, weapons, and microliths made from slate, flint, and quartz. Initially, radiocarbon dating suggested that the site was actually occupied as far back as 7000 BC, fully occupied and then abandoned between about 6000 and 5900 BC, and then reoccupied sometime in the 4th millennium BC. Only four samples were used for that dating, however, so in 2019, archaeologists conducted even more radiocarbon tests on organic remains found at Omnia 1, 
which has substantially revised our understanding of the development of the site. Of the ten houses located here, initially it was thought that House 1 was the oldest inhabitable structure, and that Ditch 1 was constructed around the same time along with House 4. Ditch 1 was then filled in at some point, Houses 2 and 3 were built, and Ditch 2 and a palisade were then erected. After this, House 8 and House 9 were constructed, and then Ditch 3 was built, along with Houses 5, 6, and 7. Recent work has totally flipped this chronology. We now have two phases of habitation and construction. An initial period of building around 6100 BC, and then around 6000 or 5900 BC, the site expanded and was increasingly fortified. It was then abandoned at some point and reoccupied during the 4th millennium BC. Based on the distribution of incised ware pottery, which is the oldest of the two styles known from the area, it's probably House 9 that was constructed first, not House 1 as was initially thought, with House 1 and House 4 following the construction of House 9. After that, the rest was constructed between about 6000 and about 5900 BC. At this time, it's not clear if the houses were occupied year-round or not, but even if they weren't, by about 6000 BC, a fairly complex set of structures was beginning to take form. We also have evidence here of what looks to be social stratification. The larger pit houses, especially House 1, which is the biggest, are located on elevations in comparison to the rest of the houses and structures at the site, and they're located behind the ditches and the palisades. That layout does not just apply to Omnia 1, but to 7 of the 8 known sites from the area, the exception being Omnia 2 since that is unfortified, but the fact that it's so close to Omnia 1 is maybe a sign that the two sites are actually one whole unit, with the elites dwelling in Omnia 1 and the commoners dwelling in Omnia 2. So, why would fortified settlements like this have developed in the region prior to agriculture? Archaeologists are still debating this, but an emerging answer looks like it revolves around a combination of food production, violence, and climate change. The presence of pottery points toward long-term food storage, and given the wildlife in the region, much of that probably consisted of smoked meat. Omnia 1 shows repeated evidence of fire damage, which probably means that the settlement was attacked more than once, which would also explain the presence of arrowheads and other weapons located there, especially in the ditches. Omnia 1 is located on a promontory overlooking marshland, and sediment cores taken from this marsh indicate that before 6000 BC there was a lake located here, but after about 6000 BC it slowly began to dry. And, just prior to that change starting, was a global climate event known as the 8.2 kilo year event, which saw a very sudden decrease in average temperature across the globe by about 3 degrees Celsius on average. That's enough to damage the growth cycles of many plants, and it's toward the end of that event that Omnia 1 began to be constructed. There are three possible scenarios here, the specifics of which are not necessarily exclusive to each theory. Interpretation number one is that a change in climate would eventually have negatively impacted food resources, necessitating the people of the Omnia complex to begin hoarding that food and establishing the Fort of Omnia 1 in an attempt to protect those resources against those who would take them by force. Interpretation number two is that rather than negatively impacting food supplies, climate change saw a regional warming in this area, leading to more resources, and the accumulation and storage of this newfound wealth eventually led to social stratification. The third interpretation is that there was a population movement from outside the local area, possibly driven by climate change, which enabled cultural mixing, and then the local populations learned new techniques from the newcomers, leading to the development of the Omnia 1 site. That being said, the burn layers from Omnia 1 and the other fortified sites known to archaeologists strongly suggest that no matter the specifics, new stresses in the area led to intergroup competition and eventually to warfare. And through warfare and competition, either led directly to social stratification, or gave ongoing stratification a significant boost, probably in defense of hunting grounds that individual groups considered their own territories. So, what are the implications of the Omnia complex? Well, it certainly distinguishes Siberia from the surrounding regions. Outside of Siberia, we begin to see territoriality, and eventually what we would understand to be agriculturally-based chiefdoms and then states, through a combination of fortifications, 
cemeteries, and agricultural fields. Within Siberia, however, the continually accumulating evidence indicates that agriculture is not necessarily required for those two other things to exist. The development of Omnia 1 starts a long tradition in Siberia of fort construction, which would last until the conquest of the region by the Russian Empire in the 16th and 17th centuries. But perhaps more importantly, it clearly demonstrates a phenomenon that anthropologists and archaeologists have been realizing for several decades now. There is no distinct binary between hunter-gatherer, that is, nomad, and farmer, that is, a settled individual tied to the land. We tend to conceive of societal complexities and the accompanying architecture as being connected to settled societies, but the evidence from Omnia 1 shows that hunter-gatherers were more than capable of constructing semi-permanent or even permanent settlements of their own.